This chapter covers fluids, electrolytes, and acid-base balance. So we're going to start by looking at the major compartments within the body where the major fluids are. And you can see that there's three major compartments, but we can combine two of them into one major compartment. And that would be the ECF or the extracellular fluid. That's approximately 20% of our body weight. And that's all the fluid that's outside of the cell. So the large majority of that fluid is found in the tissue area and it's found in between the cells. So since it's between cells, we call it interstitial fluid. And we can see that that's a large amount of the extracellular fluid, 80% of it. And the rest of it is going to be the plasma which is what is found in the blood vessel itself. And so those two compartments make up the extracellular fluid. However, the, the major compartment is what, of course, is inside of the cell. And that would be the ICF, which stands for intracellular fluid. That makes up 40% of our body weight. So that's what's inside of the cell. So be sure you're aware that extracellular fluid can be subdivided into two categories. And then the intracellular fluid is the most significant, the largest category. So when we talk about body fluids, first we want to remember that water is the universal solvent. So the large amount of plasma is the water, the universal solvent and solutes are dissolved in this water. So that would be anything like sodium, potassium, anything that is a smaller chemical. And these solutes, they can either be non-electrolytes or electrolytes. In the case of non-electrolytes, they don't have a charge to them, like glucose, for example. An electrolyte would be something like sodium or potassium. So non-electrolyte examples are shown here glucose, lipids, and so on. And electrolytes, they have a greater osmotic power than non-electrolytes. And so this is very important because it helps fluids to shift into one specific area. So remember, if a cell is in a hypertonic solution, for example, water is going to leave that cell. And the fluid is kind of attracted towards those particles. So when we compare the composition, remember that the main cation in the extracellular fluid is sodium, and the major anion is chlorine, which is the reason when someone goes in a hospital, the first, the, the main ions that are given to them are saline, the salt, the sodium, and the chloride. In the intracellular fluid, the major cation is potassium, and the major anion, is going to be going to contain the phosphorus primarily and in the form of an acid. So when we compare the two, remember um, what is found in each. The electrolytes are the most abundant you know, solutes in the body fluids, and they have a, a major role that they play in most chemical as well as physical reactions. So our next slide shows us a nice chart comparing the various electrolytes. So just to reinforce the major element or the major electrolytes in the extracellular fluid, we have sodium and chloride. And then in the intracellular fluid, we have potassium as the cation, but we also have hydrogen phosphate as the anion. And so make sure that you study this chart as far as what the major electrolytes are of the blood plasma, interstitial fluid, and the intracellular fluid. And remember that the blood plasma and the interstitial fluid are both compartments within the extracellular fluid. So the reason that these are so very important, these various electrolytes are kind of what I just already mentioned, the fact that they dictate which way fluid moves. 
So for example, you need to remember that when there's a change in the solute concentration of any compartment, this is going to lead to the net flow of water in one specific direction. So therefore, when there's an increase in the extracellular fluid osmolality, and osmolality is uh, determining all the solutes, not just one specific solute. So it, it's pretty much similar to osmolarity, but there is a, a, a bit of a difference there. So the greater the osmolality, that means hypertonic, water is going to leave the cell. The, with the opposite situation, when there's a decrease in osmolality, imagine that there's a hypotonic situation now outside of the cell. That is going to cause water to enter the cell. So again, these are so very important to, to allow water to go in one direction or the other. So all the fluid compartments in the body now um, and how exchange happens between the lungs, the GI tract, and the kidneys are shown very well for you on this slide. In the case of the lungs, we now know from the respiratory system that oxygen diffuses from the alveoli into the blood and then it eventually is transferred into the tissues. And carbon dioxide goes in the opposite direction. In the gastrointestinal tract, so this would be in primarily the small intestine, nutrients are going to enter into the bloodstream and then into the tissues. And, waters and water and ions, water leaves as well to go into the blood. In the case of the kidney, which you've already learned about, there's water and ions that are going to enter that into the urine so that our body gets rid of them. The same with nitrogenous waste. So when we talk about water balance and extracellular fluid osmolality, it's important to remember that our water intake should equal the water output, in versus out. And so the water intake, most of that water is actually taken in via foods and beverages, as we can imagine, but there's a small amount from metabolism. And that is called metabolic water or the water of oxidation. And so the water output should be about 60% urine, and then there's what's called insensible water loss. That's basically the water that we don't really notice. It's lost through the skin and the lungs. There's perspiration and then also feces. So the osmolality should stay at a certain range, around 280 to 300 milliosmoles. And if you remember, that was the approximate osmolality of the PCT and the DCT. So when there's a rise in osmolality, so we have a hypertonic situation, we want the body needs to return to homeostasis. So that does a couple things. First, it stimulates the thirst center, which is in the hypothalamus. It also causes a DH release, which prevents water from leaving the body in the form of urine and reabsorbs it into the bloodstream. A decrease in osmolality does the opposite. It inhibits the thirst center in the hypothalamus and it also causes ADH inhibition. So now we're getting rid of extra water to have the opposite effect. So this chart is showing us the intake on the left and then the output on the right. So be aware of the various amounts and the percentages. And so the regulation of output is controlled by the thirst center and the thirst center is specifically referring to the the hypothalamus so those osmoreceptors are activated when the osmolality increases there's a dry mouth the blood pressure goes down or, or there's um, input of angiotensin 2 or the baroreceptors so there's several mechanisms that can activate the thirst center found in the hypothalamus.